Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here for uh, what's going to be a great session, I hope. Uh, you can move closer. It's all right. I'm, I'm afraid of Chimamanda. I, well, so am I. But that's, <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here. You got to sit there. Uh, I have, this is an amazing, uh, amazing uh, group, uh, amazing group of two, amazing couple of writers here. Um, MacArthur Genius Grant recipients, which we can make fun of whenever you feel like it. Um, uh, two of the most important uh, writers in the world today. And, and our, our subject is uh, the city and identity. So let's, let's, let me go right at this and ask you uh, sort of an obvious question. Uh, it's a thought that I have on the subway in New York frequently, where you know, you're, you're crushed in with hundreds of people you got a Jamaican guy next to a Chinese guy, next to a Hasidic guy, next to an Arab guy. Uh, and I often think that this is a wondrous thing because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't end in chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if there's a lesson for the world about that. You know, we talk about, I'll just use America as an example. America is considered a melting pot, right? But it's actually not all of America that's the melting pot. It's the cities that are a melting pot. So I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about why, from a perspective of identity, national, tribal, creedal, religious, why, why cities work the way they do? What do, what do people understand about other people that they can't understand other than being in close proximity? Thank you, Chimamanda. You could have took that. She will. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I love both of them, so if you detect any repartee, it's friendly repartee. Um, Except when it gets not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you just become acculturated to certain things. You know, um, I, I can remember, um, it's not like I've lived in a bunch of cities, but I, I know like when I came to New York for the first time, uh, I absolutely hated it. Everything you're talking about, the lack of space, the being squished together, this, this wasn't a value I'd actually had. I had grown up in a city uh, in Baltimore, but very, very different in terms of you know, how space is and how, how space is organized. The city is the opposite of social media in a way. You have to see the person. Right, right, yeah. right, right. And then you, you, know, you get used to it, and then after a while you almost like it, like it actually becomes a good thing. So much so that when I first came here to Paris, I actually fell in love in the subway. It was, it was the squishing together thing that felt intensely familiar to me that I liked right off the bat. So, but I think at the same time, you can't mistake that for real social integration because everybody goes home afterwards, you know, and we tend to live in our separate communities. Right. Shimon? I agree. <laughs> this is off to a great start. Wow. <laughs> Can we just I, do that? Can you I just, just, can just keep that going? I did, I did warn you that I'm sleep deprived, so I'm a little <laughs> slow. But I, I think, I, I mean, I'm, I, I think I'm going to be the person who dampens things a little and say that we have it's to It's usually care, him, so that's fine. We have to be careful not to romanticize cities because I think there's also something that can be alienating about it. Uh -huh. That you, uh, um, so I live, in, I live partly in Lagos, and Lagos is huge, and there's an energy there that I absolutely love. But it can also feel as though people walk past one another. Hmm. You know, um, and, and, and maybe, I mean, I don't know that, that in places that are not cities that people necessarily connect, whatever the hell connect is, but. So I think cities are lovely. I think Lagos is lovely. I, I, I think New York is, a, is a, um, an interesting place. My other favorite city is London. Uh, I, also, I like the tube in London. I How do you feel about Paris? <laughs> <laughs> I find Paris <laughs> to it's be... It's okay. Keep going. I'm, I'm not... Um, and, I, and, you know, I don't think Paris needs my love because a lot of people love this city, but I don't think I would count myself among the people who do. What, what is it about it that, that... Maybe it's not even a Paris thing, maybe it's a general... It just seems to me that the French did not get the memo that they're no longer a world power. <laughs> and so there's a kind of... I mean, there's just a kind of sort of superior stiffness that is unbearable to me. And and I think, I think also the relationship is complicated because obviously I'm West African and France has a yeah. very complicated... Yeah, it's different. Yeah, it's different. which is why... London also has no, a complicated no, exactly relationship. Right. No, but it's, dif it's different though because, I mean, 
and, and not to excuse or not to diminish British colonialism, but, you know, at least the UK isn't in control of the Nigerian currency today in the way that, that France is really in control of the CFA. Um, the, recent, the relationship between the UK and its, its former colonies is not quite as, as vexed, I don't think. Uh -huh. And so when I was, I was teasing him about loving Paris and yeah. telling him that he's sort of... I really love Paris. Let's just be that. Wait, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to have him rise to the defense in a second. Yeah. He, he's, 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 he's getting ready, I he's doing just the, He's just really doing the James Baldwin thing. But anyway... Yeah. Um, I just <laughs> not, not that there's anything wrong with you doing the James Baldwin thing. By oh, the I way. adore James Baldwin. We, we can't all be too much. But, but here's the thing, though. No, but I, but I understand it because I think we have very we have different perspectives. She's I think right. that when you're an American, you, you have a different relationship with France. Uh -huh. um, so so just arriving mm -hmm. here with my Nigerian passport at the airport, I experienced the most humiliating, um, mm. a, annoying questioning. And I could tell it's just because of the passport. Had I given an American passport, it would have been entirely different. Really? So, um, so I think it's just a, yeah, I think it's just a, a, a prejudice that I carry with pride. But I, I want know, to know, just, let, let me, can I frame this for yeah, you? Yeah, sure. No, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting. I want to frame this for you because we know each other well. And right. I made this observation to you last night that I know you in New York, I know you in Washington, and I know you in Paris. And in Paris, you're so much lighter um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a happiness about you that um, is, is on, an unburdened happiness. And I'm wondering, what, what does this city do for you that New York and Washington don't? I actually think it's the flip side of, um, like, if you think about Americana, right, mm -hmm. and the relationship of Africans to America. I, I have no historical, this isn't my sin. Like, whatever yeah. the French did in their colonialism, yeah. I'm not their... Um, I can't use that word here. Um, I, they <laughs> Can I use it for you? No, don't. Please don't. You're going to get me fired. Um, I'm, I, we don't have the historical relationship. There's not the tension. So I, it was actually, I was listening to what you were saying um, in terms of the, uh, the stiffness. And I actually perceive, it, perceive the exact same thing. Mm. But I like it. Hmm. I like the stiffness. I like the, the hidebound traditionalism. But... I think I have the luxury of liking it because mm -hmm. it's distant. Do, do you know what I mean? Yep, there's no, yep. It doesn't bring back any sort of, there's no colonial memory yep. for it with me. Like, I don't, and as you, as you said, I mean, when I come here, I have an American passport. So it's a, um, I, I recognize it's a love born out of a luxury, you know? Um, I would say somewhat similar maybe, and you can comment on this, the way certain Africans feel when they come to America yep. in a way that I would not, yep. you know? I think that's true, yeah. Um, I want, I, yeah, go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. I, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship of, of writers to their cities. Um, there's a certain kind of person, obviously, who uh, benefits from solitude, being in the country, being in a cabin. Um, other kinds of people uh, draw off the city. There's a practical question embedded here, which is a lot of cities, and you hear this discussion at conferences like this, a lot of cities want to draw the creative class to their downtowns, for instance, right? So, so we can grapple with that one in a minute, but the broader question is, where do you write best? And what is it about cities, in particular cities, that allow you to write best? You're doing mainly nonfiction, you're doing mainly fiction, but... I, Go ahead. I, I, where do I write best? When, when I write best when, wherever I can write. And it really depends on mm. when the spirits mm. smile at me. Mm. But I, I find that when I'm in Lagos, I don't write. In general, I don't write as well because there's too much noise. And it's not just physical noise, it's psychic noise. And in a good way. So I have family, I have friends, there's a lot going on. And I, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm absorbing. And when I go back to the US, it's much quieter because I don't have a life in the US. And so- You don't have a life? No. Oh, that's sad. It's actually not sad. It's all by design. I'm mm. quite happy in I, you know, my family and my, and I live in small town Maryland, and it's I like it. I, I like the quiet, bland American suburbia. <laughs> so that's then when I think I mostly write when I'm in the U.S. Because there's nothing else to do. Well, <laughs> that's putting it a little. Too. No, it's just that I. It's it's the space. It's where I can create space for myself. Okay. and silence, and silence is important to me. Okay, T? 
I think I really need the, the buzz and the, and the energy of cities. But, you know, I, I have to confess, um, I am uh, arriving at travel relatively late in life. Um, I think maybe later than most people in this room. When's the first time you left the United States? Well, I left the United States when I was uh, nine years old to go to London and did not leave the United States again until I was 37. 37. 37 was the next time I left the United States. And so this is, a lot of this is, I mean, even here, I, I mean, it's new for me. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like a, a child. I, I say that to say I'm reluctant to draw hard conclusions, you know, about what, what, what I actually do right best. I mean, it may be that, you know, cities are bad for me ultimately, but it's all I know. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, right now, it's, it's all I, 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 really, I really know. Well, we'll just do, do a quick turn on that practical question of what cities can do to make themselves amenable to creative people. Oh, I don't want that. You can do, you know, a little. No, I'm not talking about tax policy and what is it about a city. <laughs> no, no, but they should. Not really. I, there's something. Uh, okay, so that, that probably would disturb me on two levels. One, um, I guess I feel like as, as the writer, I want human beings to do what human beings do. Like, I don't want them, like, the, I get energy from human beings being human beings, not human beings trying to create a, an environment for me. But, but on the second level, I think the thing that has to be acknowledged is, um, I get a little nervous whenever I hear this conversation about um, a, a creative class of people um, because there are actual people who are already living in those cities, um, who have loyalty and, and, and love for those you know, uh, cities. And um, I always wonder whether they're being included in that conversation as, as creative. You know, uh, we have a, an, um, a music form in Washington, D.C. called GoGo. -Go. It's one of the best local music forms you can ever hear, but as a creative class has moved into a creative class, has moved into Washington, D.C., you actually hear less and less go-go in the city. So the thing that was most creative and distinctive, you know, from my time there, is actually being pushed out, you know what I mean? Because it wasn't necessarily recognized in, in, in that way. Yeah. Would, would you talk a, little, talk a little bit about the gentrification process, because the downside of a city of a city revitalizing is that, and I think about this in the, in the case of Washington, you have extraordinary number of liberal whites moving in, and it's kind of like this, uh, this, this dark magic trick or something like that, evil magic trick, where suddenly, where are the black people who lived on 14th Street? Where are the black people who lived on 8th Street Northeast? Um, I mean, to talk, fr frame that out a little bit, because there are, if we're gonna do the downsides of revitalization, it could be plausibly considered one of the downsides of revitalization. Actually, I'd, I'd like to talk about Paris instead. Really? Yes. I'm sure the people out here from Paris are <laughs> going to be very excited about whatever you have to say right now. <laughs> because in some ways, I feel um, similarly to, uh, uh, to Tanahasi in, this, in that idea of sort of, you know, well, I, I think there's a sort of a, a global elite, and I, I realize that I'm a member of it, and I yeah, enjoy, sorry about that, but I enjoy you, some you, of the privileges. I think it was the MacArthur Genius <laughs> but so, card but sometimes, that you got. <laughs> but sometimes there's a conversation about things like, you know, how do you get a creative class? And I think the, the first thing to do would be to have affordable housing for people mm. to have. Mm. You know, let's have apartments where people mm. don't have to pay crazy money to live in mm. them. And I also think that fixing a city doesn't necessarily have to involve pushing out people who have been there for, for generations. I mean, surely there has to be a way to, to have both. Mm. But, but the reason I said I wanted to talk about Paris, <laughs> and look, I know that there are wonderful things about this city, right? Um, but it's also about being inclusive. Um, if, mm. if you talk to black people in Paris, mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting, by which I mean black French people, mm -hmm. it's very interesting how their relationship with Paris, especially the, the sort of the creative centers of Paris, they feel very excluded. Mm. I have a, a French, a black French um, friend who said to me that when she goes into Paris proper, she pretends to be Anglophone mm. because she said if you're, if you're a foreign black person, you get a bit more respect. Is that what you experienced, Tanasi? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a book that was translated in French, and one of the best things about the book was I got to... Uh, talk to French black people about uh, France. Now, I mean, I, I'd read enough to not be completely naive, you know, when I yeah. came in, not to say, oh, there's, you know, there's no racism, da 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 yeah. But, um, and not just French black people, also uh, uh, um, French people with origins in, in, uh, in the Maghreb from Algeria, Tunisia, and that sort of thing. The interaction is definitely very, very different. And right. so it's clear that it's a, a luxury 
right. that, 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 that you're enjoying. But I want to stay with your point for a second. Is that, is that something that's unique to Paris, this, this, this experience? Of um, no, obviously not. And so I, but I think that there's something about the, the, the Paris example that um, I think New York, I don't think, for example, that seeing a black person in the center of, of as, as a black woman here was saying to me that she, and she was Nigerian, so she wasn't French, but she said she lived in the center of Paris. And, and whenever she was out, people were just surprised to see her mm. because there was a sense in which she didn't mm. belong there. It was unusual. Mm. I don't think that's the case in New York City with all its problems. I mean, not to, I don't think that's necessarily the case in London either. Um, I, so, I, I, so I think that there is something about, about this city that, um, I mean, I don't want to say it's the most, <laughs> it's a city that doesn't include people. But, uh, but I think there's something particular about it. Mm. No, it is. I think there's a definite difference. There's like, I, I, again, not being from it, but I perceive a definite cultural conservatism that I don't feel in New York. At the same time, though, um, you will go in spaces in New York, very nice restaurant, for instance, and people will be very, very happy to see you. But there are no other black people in the restaurant. Not um, even the servers. Not even the servers not even the service, which I do see here and somehow makes me feel more hmm. better about it than like, well, I can't even get a job here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you appreciate the idea of you, but the actual pres I went to yeah. just the, and here's where we're gonna marry the two things, right? The French and the Anglo tradition. I went to New Orleans uh, a few months back, and the restaurant I went to, everyone working there, all of the, all of the servers, were young black men that were under the age of 20. It was the most beautiful thing. And I was, I was like, this is, this is perfect. I mean, New Orleans has a ton of problems, but something about yeah. that was just, I was like, I've never, ever seen this. I feel, you know, absolutely fine. The restaurant wasn't a black restaurant. The majority of people there weren't black, but it was something about the fact that they actually, you know, were, were employed, that they could be the face of the restaurant. Mm. And that's something that I, I, I don't usually see, you know, mm. in, in cities. Mm. Uh, let me ask you, uh, this is sort of a broad essay question, but uh, it, I would love to get your thoughts on this. The, if the 19th century, this has been said by other people, not just me, 19th century is the century of the empire, the 20th century is the century of the nation state, is the 21st century going to be the century of the city state? I mean, I ask you this, is you're, you're very international people now, and you move from city to city, and you're comfortable some cities make you more comfortable, some cities make you less comfortable, obviously, but you're comfortable in those scenarios. Uh, are, do you think that we're moving toward a, 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 a situation in which the, the idea of the city-state um, uh, becomes salient again? We see in America, obviously, the divide is not between uh, Austin and New York, it's between Texas and New York, or, or sort of the middle of the country in New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, Take it away, Tanahasi. How come Chimamanda can't go first? Because she mean, has jet lag. I told you I was going to be nice to her today. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Honestly, I, I don't know. It, it, you know. I would have to, I guess, think about the premise of the question first. Um, obviously, um, that doesn't sound like a future I want to be part of. Um, I, but it's America that you write about already. I mean, I want to come directly to your writing, your yeah, recent writing on Donald Trump like, and what he means for America. Right, right, right. But I, d I don't want myself mocked off like it's some sort of urbanite from, from the country. You know what I mean? Like, like, I don't want that to be the difference. And, and, and for very, very real reasons beyond, you know, the, the, the idea of just, you know, not wanting that, that identity. I mean, my, my heritage is from the eastern shore of Maryland, um, African-American heritage, you know, comes out of the country, comes out of Mississippi, comes out of the fields, comes out of, you know, Virginia. Um, and so I, I, I was born where I was born. Um, I am who I am at, you know, 42 years of age Do you feel that right Baltimore now, made you or America made no, you? No, the Eastern Shore of Maryland made me. The Eastern Shore of Maryland, I mean, even I though was, Baltimore yeah, was your home yeah, most of the yeah, time. Yeah, 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 that was, and I didn't have the same, you know, the kind of maybe physical connection that I, I you know, wanted to, but that was where my mother was from, that was where my mother's side of the family was from, where my grandmother's, that was where the stories were from. Um, that, 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 so I would, we tend to forget black people live in the country too, <laughs> you know? Jermon, talk about the Lagos experience. I mean, it's, uh, uh, do people in Lagos feel separated from what's happening outside of Lagos? 
Um, I don't, I don't know. I think, I mean, I actually find myself wondering why the hell should we even bridge the divide between mm. urban and city? Why should we breach the divide? Yes. Because uh, you're a uniter, not a divider? <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Why, it, why would you think that it's not good for the sake of civil society, for the sake mm -hmm. of equity and harmony, not to bridge that rural-urban divide? But I, I think then I want to question the, the very notion of divide. Hmm. Because I, right, I, I, I also think that this is the sort of thing that happens in events like this. I think that Lagos... I think Lagosians think of themselves, because Lagos is kind of Nigeria's melting point. People come from all over Nigeria. Lagos is a place where you go to pursue the dream. Um, and that's where your dream will die or not. And I think there's something about Lagosians that is distinct, I think, from, from the rest of Nigeria. It's, it's more progressive in general. Mm -hmm. It's more... Um, I, I want to say it's more... Yes, it's a melting point, but also you find quite often very deep, ugly, and often politicized ethnic divides in Lagos. So in Lagos, you'll find mm. the Hausa community fighting the Yoruba community, often in the poor areas of Lagos, and killing one another. Um, I, I think, but also Lagos is the place where people sort of, they build their houses, but then at Christmas, everybody goes back to their ancestral hometowns where they still have a connection. So I think Lagos is that place that kind of belongs to you, but nobody really, very few people really are from Lagos in that way where your, you know, where your, where your eastern shore is, where your, where your, your, your sort of deep ancestral love is. Mm -hmm. I, I think of Lagos as my home, but every Christmas, I go with my family to my ancestral hometown. Mm -hmm. But we go back to this point about not bridging the divide. It is a preoccupation, obviously, of politicians in different parts of, of the world. Why? Is it because it's unbridgeable and it's not worth trying? Or you said something interesting yeah. about, about whether it's worth br uh, bridging that, uh, that gap. I think maybe because I don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it seems to me that what we're really saying is how do we get those people in the rural areas to act more like us? Mm -hmm. mm. How do we get them to be? And my feeling is that, um, you know, there's something to be said for areas in the wall that are not cities. Uh, and you know, we, we, there's so much talk in Nigeria to, today about agriculture and about how we need to feed ourselves. And we can't do that if all of Nigeria becomes a city. But you can't grow it in Lagos, obviously. No, right. not even on rooftops Ta like Ta in New York City. Can you talk about this in the context of today's America, uh, you know, where you have uh, cities that went 90, 95% for Hillary Clinton, rural areas that uh, you couldn't find a Clinton sign for hundreds of miles. What does that mean, and how do you refract that through the prism of this urban, rural divide? And is, uh, it worth, is it worth repairing, or is it just the way it is? I think uh, there is a population of people uh, who live in a lot of those areas um, where, um, I mean, let's be very clear, on average, they tend to be doing better than most African Americans that live in the cities and most Latinos that live in the cities. Uh, but maybe don't necessarily feel optimistic about you know, uh, the future for their children. Um, and I think for a long time in America's history, you know, the presidency is more than just someone that, that you know, enacts actual policy. Um, it's a symbol. And um, I think for a long time, uh, the symbol in the White House was at least of the idea, my child can be that one day. You know, there's this thing that happened when Barack Obama was elected where people would say, um, well, now I can tell my son or my daughter that they, they can be president. And I don't think folks consider the negative of that, the flip side of that, which is if this person can be president, I can't. Now, that sounds sort of illogical, but race in America and whiteness in America has always been zero sum. It's always been like that. It's not, you know, it's not an inclusive idea, actually. Um, and so I think, you know, there was a negative symbol sent by those, you know, obviously by negative, I don't mean a, a symbol that, you know, I wouldn't endorse, but there were folks that received it in a negative way, who saw those rallies, saw these, you know, big, you know, multicultural crowds and this multicultural cabinet, and, you know, they, they, they perceived it a certain way um, as an insult, you know? And I, I think that explains a lot about uh, Trumpism. The, the city, I think, in that case, is a stand-in for other divides that are already actually there. It's a polite way 
right. of you know, saying something that's actually already there. Right. Jermond, I want to ask a last question to you uh, as the author of a new treatise on feminism. Um, we are at a uh, rupture moment, I think, in American society, and probably it's bled beyond the borders of America by now. Um, I think you see it in, in, in France, too. Um, because of the, it, the triggering event was this Harvey Weinstein uh, uh, controversy. But um, I, I would just love to, and I think the audience would love to hear your view about whether or not, well, whether or not my observation is right, that this is actually um, a break point, a tipping point in the way we understand um, relations between the sexes. I want it to be, I hope, I hope it is, but I'm, my sense is that it isn't. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because, I mean, Bill Cosby happened, and, and there's a, a bit of noise, and then there's a hung jury, which just didn't make sense to me. And for me, following the Harvey Weinstein story, I've been struck by how, I read the comments in the New York Times, and I'm struck by how, you know, ostensibly liberal, progressive people, how so much of the comments are about blaming the women, there's still, I think there's still... Never read the comments, by the way. Well, I First read rule of the internet. I, I don't read things about myself, but I do, for me, it's kind of a way to gauge, especially when it comes to gender conversations, how people are reacting. And again, we're not talking about Trump voters. We're talking about, you know, people who read the New York Times. And there's a lot of, you know, why did she wait so long? Why? Wait, did I say something funny? I mean, you assume that there's no overlap between the Trump voter I, I and the New think York we Times. Can, I think we can safely say that the overlap is very limited. I mean, he runs against the New York Times. That's like, you know what I mean, failing mm -hmm. New York Times. I think that's defensible. You can go on. Yeah, go on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but so I, 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 want, I want to hope that it is, but I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think that the problem of gender is so deeply entrenched. And I think it's so difficult to talk about because there's a sense in which the, People expect a kind of overt and obvious way of proving that something bad has happened, that, that, mm. it's, that gender mm. is a problem. Mm. And, and especially in places like the US, it's, it's a lot more subtle. I mean, mm. Javier Weinstein is kind of this um, florid example, but mm. it happens every day in, in every industry, you know, mm. the way that women are put down, the way that women are judged differently, the way... And, and somehow talking about it is difficult because somebody says to you, well, why do you really think Hillary Clinton being a woman contributed? Oh, it's just because she's very stiff and she's not, mm -hmm. you know, she and, oh, and the emails and mm -hmm. all of that. And you think, no, there's a lot of it that's gender, but it's not easy to sort of say, here's the proof. It's not like burning a cross in somebody's yard. And, and sometimes I worry that maybe what we need to do is shift the way we talk about it. So that instead of saying, maybe Harvey Weinstein shouldn't be what we use as an example of mm. the problem with gender. Mm. Because it's too cartoonish. Mm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Mm. Yeah. Tanahasi, any words on this? Mm. Do you have any thoughts on this before I'm we I'm going to end this like we started. I agree. Chirimanda <laughs> 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 Tanahasi, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. <laughs>